Yeah, social media is a wonderful tool. It's allowed people like me to have a voice on a public platform, and it brings on awareness and recognition globally to not only individuals, but businesses, which we possibly would never have even encountered with otherwise. Naturally, humans possess a fundamental drive to compare themselves with others, and social networking sites like Facebook and Instagram have made it easier than ever to do so. So today, let's talk self-love. We'll be measuring the upward social comparison of media and society with Rochester, New York guests, Hannah Piquet and author Brian Caterino. This is episode 22, Self Love. My name is Amanda Ashley. I'm your host. Welcome to Afternoon Cocktail. The wonderful, the beautiful, Miss Hannah Piquet. How are you, my love? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. How are you? Except for my hair soaking wet, I'm, I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. My hair is still a little wet, too, but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, what are you going to play for us? You're going to perform one of your original songs? Yes, um, I, I prepare uh, one slow song and one more upbeat song for later, but um, I'm going to do this song called It's Raining in My Heart since uh, yesterday, today, it's been raining where I am. I don't know how it's been where you are, but um, what, did it rain today? It's raining hard by us right now. Well, yeah. Then it's, yeah, so it's a, it's a song for that. It's called It's Raining in My Heart. <laughs> Take it away. Well, I'm awake enough to do it. Okay, let's see. <laughs>
sing those blues and play those keys like that. I love it. Hannah, I am so proud to know you. And I I mean, as a personally and, and professionally, I mean, I remember seeing you, I don't even know how long it's it's been. It's probably... Probably four or five years ago, yeah. Mm-hmm. Probably more than... I'm thinking it's been more than that. Probably closer to eight years. Mm. Um, anyhow, I remember seeing you at an open mic in East Rochester. One of my friends who was a cook at where I was waitressing at Lemoncello, mm. he had started his open mic, and he was like, man, to come down sometime. So I went down to support him. And um, I saw you, you were the first person I was like on stage playing keys, you were rocking out to some (laughs) drunk people singing. And I was like, who is this girl? And you were great. And he's like, wait till you hear her sing. And um, that's kind of how I found you originally. And then our, our friendship kind of blossomed from there. But I've watched you go through so many transitions personally and professionally and um, I, I'm really proud of you and oh, I hope you this is thank proud you of yourself. So You've done so great for our community. Um, what discoveries about yourself has your musical journey taught you? Oh, first of all, I um, thank you so much coming from you. It's such a kind words means a lot and uh, and you know you've always been so supportive of everybody like that's why you were there even that night. Um, so what discovery, I think, uh, obviously, you know, I'm still learning about myself, but, um, I, um, in a way, I think certain hardships made me learn more about myself that I didn't really know about. I think a lot of, especially women out there can relate how crazy our, uh, life, you know, when we are going into from like, from teenager to the woman in their 20s. So going through my 20s with a lot of turmoils uh, actually led me to discover really truly, um, I guess more more of my true identity than what I thought I had to be for people around me uh, that kind of expected me to be that way. Um, and uh, I think one thing is I, I've been always open-minded person, but I, you know, that's I think really big part of me that when I carried on my, with my life with open-mindedness, uh, you can actually let a lot of different wisdom uh, let in to you. So um, it's been a lot of learning experiences, uh, even if that sometimes get me in trouble too. <laughs> um, yeah. And just, uh, you know, try to be uh, as uh, kind as I can. It's another thing I learned about the, the better you are to other people, the happier you yourself are. And so I used to be a lot more critical and judgmental and pessimistic, but doing music uh, kind of changed me because I had to be very humble and grateful. And I'm amazed by every every little kindness that all the other people are has showing, showing me, such as you yourself. So yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's a lot of blabbering. I don't know. It's, no, you're not blabbering. I, I think there's so much truth to what you're saying, and I, I, I feel that and have gone through similar experiences. I think that's what's bonded us, you know, in mm-hmm. the past and in the present, you know. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, I, I can't even imagine you having a mean bone in your body. Oh, like, yeah, I can be very bitter. <laughs> you know, really? I think when, no way. When we, are, when we are, you know, artists, I think we are sensitive. So we are sensitive to the beauty, but we are sensitive to the ugliness too. And it really gets to you sometime, you know. I can I can be very, very dark, but I really try not to pass that, you know, cross that line too much. Uh, so actually performing helps me because performing, I want to present uh, the certain level of positivity while still speaking the truth. So I think it kind of makes me work on the negativity, negativities I have within myself, you know, because I don't necessarily want to just, bring that to other people if I can help it. So sure. um, yeah, so being a musician helps, I think helps me to be a better person. <laughs> I agree. Um, so, I mean, you're originally from South Korea, Korea. That's my Long Island coming, <laughs> coming out. Uh, at what age did you come to the States? Um, it's now over a decade ago, really. Um, I was graduating from college, but it was because I, um, I met a, a guy, uh, American guy, actually. And then uh, after we met, uh, we dated for a few years, but um, he later 
uh, went to a school in Rochester, then later Syracuse. So um, I came to Rochester to be with him. And um, even though I'm not with him, uh, different jobs worked out really good for me here in this city. So I ended up staying. Uh, I, I kept having the reason to stay. And now the music is kept in me here too. Sure. Now you come from, your father was actually a musician, correct? Mm, he is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did he have any inspiration on you creating your own music? Yeah, I mean, I it will be a lie if I say no because uh, music was such a big part of um, him, or well, he still is, and because of that, you know, it was very a uh, big thing in our life, and uh, he still is a musician. So, um, but he had a lot of interest in um, also Western music as well as Korean music. So I think I was lucky. Uh, that I was exposed to a lot of different kind of music than maybe other Korean kids might have been, especially at the time. Uh, I think you, 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 you are you and I are probably like the last generation that had child uh, childhood without internet, sort of, right? <laughs> Later yeah. on, it kind of started happening. Um, so yes, I mean, he and I used to have so many conversations about music and um, also. Um, philosophy and things like that. So I think he definitely gave, uh, was a huge influence on me. Um, yeah. <laughs> what type of music filled your, your, the walls of your home growing up? I mean, you said he listened to a lot of Western music, but what type of music? Yeah, you know, one thing funny about it before, you know, I answered that question that I just thought of is, uh, but, but even though I always loved music growing up, because he, I saw his struggles as a musician as much as joy, and I think and when I was little, I saw more struggles than the joyfulness of it. So I, I told myself I would never do music for a living or anything like that. So it's just really, I, lately, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that, how funny it is. Uh, I'm living the exact life that I told myself I would never have <laughs> uh, for various <laughs> reasons. Uh, but the music, yeah, the type of music. Um, so besides Korean music, what I specifically remember that both my parents listened to was uh, something from Beatles to Led Zeppelin, Queens, um, Average White Band was one of the things <laughs> I remember, uh, Joe Sample and all that stuff, and uh, uh, Stevie Wonder, uh, Billy Joel, you know, I don't know, Bill Withers. So, you know, that, and I, my, my, my dad also had a lot of, you know, records and sheet music and I remember just going through them, listen to them, things like that. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of different things. When did you first discover blues and, and what was it about that genre that just pulled you in so deep? Um, actually that's also thanks to my dad. I think I had a little taste of the blues because he liked the music that was influenced by the blues, such as, you know, even like Led Zeppelin, uh, Queens, they, you know, hard rock, uh, took a little bit from the blues and um, he was huge fan of Eric Clapton so uh, obviously that you know Eric Clapton has a lot of those elements um, so I and when I was little I just really loved the sound it just really suited me suit my soul for whatever reason and then only after I came to the States I really learned more about the root of that music and the history and the people behind that music and my love for it only grew more and especially after meeting actual practitioners of the blues such as you know Mr. Jobio we all know uh, Mr. Janko who recently passed sadly and many other uh, musicians that actually play that music uh, and ever since my love for the music only has grown every day and I, I just don't know the reason for it I just I just love it <laughs> That's good. And now you have spent some time in one of my favorite cities. You've been spent a lot of time in Memphis, Tennessee. Can you tell us a little bit about why you were there and your experience? Yeah. Um, yeah, it is a nice place there. I, I hope to go back sometime. But uh, even though I, um, I hate the idea of competitions when it comes to arts and music, I mean, it's just such a terrifying thing to even think of putting yourself out there for a competition. But um, uh, there is a thing, what well, they call it blues challenge instead of calling it competition though. But um, so they have um, this thing where you can, uh, uh, you can 
participate in this challenge locally and if you get picked then you get to go to this national blues challenge where people from all over the country as well as other parts of the, the earth really I mean a lot of other countries including actually South Korea I met South Korean team as well uh, they get to come and kind of present you know music um, so uh, I just try for it thinking you know why not just see it'll be a good experience at the least I thought at the most I was gonna get out of it I thought to myself I'll go do this thing in Buffalo meet some other buffalo musicians then that'll be the end of the that'll be the that'll be that'll be it <laughs> but um i was very very surprised that uh, my guitarist and i were actually won the first place so we got to go to memphis so i so felt exciting. like yeah it was kind of crazy and we were really fortunate that they wanted to give us that chance uh and um you know i was pretty nervous but gosh i i think i learned so much from that experience so I'm definitely happy that I had done that. Um, so yeah, I was pl there for almost a whole week uh, playing every night because uh, it's more than one night that you have to, you have to play, uh, perform. And it's hap it happens all over the Bill Street. So um, that was really a, a part of time. And then uh, later I got connected with a very great blues musician called, uh, his name is Kenny Neal that I met there for the first time, we chatted just a little bit and I'm not really good at selling myself so we just talked and I just told him, well I'm a big fan of you and that was that and later, later on we somehow got connected again and I recently recorded an album with him in Baton Rouge, Louisiana uh, he's actually producing my album but the pandemic kind of put a little hold on it so I'm hoping that um, we can release that whenever it you know the time seems appropriate but right now there's just so many difficulties um and he's running his own label he himself is a musician so hugely impacted by this whole thing so we've been keeping in touch and just trying to see um uh, you know when we can take that next step so a lot a lot came out of that that trip so exciting yeah, yeah. i love louisiana too both oh, yeah. both louisiana and memphis like bear a lot of similarities in my opinion um, very soulful yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah all the soul the food the music the people are so beautiful um nice. i've yeah I'm, I'm really happy i'm so excited for you that you've had that not only had that experience but that so many beautiful things came out of it thank you so oh you're welcome and so today we're talking about self self-love um you know, you and I both are no strangers to to the fact that, you know, self-love is a journey within itself. What was the pivoting point in your life which basically shifted your perspective on, on everything and that turned your focus back to, to you and realizing that, hey, I, I have to take care of myself first? Was there a moment like that? You know, I, in, I, I was... Thinking about that question, I to, at least for me, there had been there have been actually big several moments of uh, moments that I remember that I think just continue to improve the way I perceive myself, and each moment kind of helped me to go next step or next phase. And then, you know, maybe months later or years later, I will experience something else and then that kind of gets me further. So it, it, it was, I can't really think of like a one exact moment, but it, you know, I think for the very first time I kind of thought about, wow, I like myself a lot more that I remember of this as a very young girl, uh, you know, when I was like 19, I, I was in love. And suddenly this guy I thought who was very cute and very handsome and I thought I was very ugly. And, uh, and so it's a silly thing now looking back at it, but, you know, but he seems to really be uh, in love with me. So I think that was kind of first a little step of sort of seeing myself differently thanks to his love that he's shown me. And I know that doesn't always happen, you know, right in life. And in fact, the relationship didn't really work out, but that gave me a little step. And then later down the road, you know, something else might happen. And then friends, you know, friends that kind of stuck with me all these years and made me kind of love myself because they, of their love, you know, and my mother's love. And I really think different people who had shown me um, their great love for me ha has actually helped me. 
So I hope that people try to focus on the positivity. We, we often think that, oh, these people don't care about me, these people don't. But there gotta be like one person, one person that really, really loves you. And I hope that you can draw something from them. And it can be even God, right? I know some of us, maybe, you know, we are very unfortunate when it comes to how many support systems we have around us. But I really do believe that everybody is loved by someone. And then, then later on, you know, that, that only goes so far though, like, you know, when you try to draw something from something from somebody externally. So I think then recently I had more of an internal growth where I really just could also draw things within myself. And so that's the next part of my journey that I'm going through. And um, I've been really learning. Uh, I'm very grateful when people like my music or people, um, you know, I say very nice things about it, but I, I really been learning myself. Ultimately, I get satisfaction from knowing that I am satisfied with what I put out. So, um, you know, just really trying to get the joy and love within itself, you know, just kind of digging deeper into what's the core of it, you know, I don't know, it's kind of a maybe very vague, but uh, it's a journey, you know, so, so I guess my answer is not particular moment that really led me to um, take care of myself, love me more, but it's just every little step, you know, I'm always trying to learn something from each moment. And I've been writing journals, which is a new thing this year. So that has also helped me really analyze why I feel that way. And sure. Then, someone's phone ringing. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's a journey. But I really hope that people can really focus hey, on Lord. the positivity. Yeah. Well, uh, Hannah, it's, uh, yeah, it's such a pleasure always to talk to you and to hear from you. And, um, you know, I... I wish you the best of luck always on, you know, I wish you continued sex, uh, sex. I wish you that too. I wish you continued success. And <laughs> I think you read my mind. <laughs> that is really weird. Lady, I really feel like something, something magical is always happening. It's like an invisible, invisible thing. Some people just have a way of seeing right through somebody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, continued love coming your way in every shape and form, Hannah. Um, Whatever so we're we gonna... can do to entertain people, right? Hopefully right. they got a good laugh. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, Hannah, thank you again. We're going to bring back Hannah later for... <laughs> I have to mute myself. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I can't. I can't. So, well, um, we're going to bring back Hannah later for another original song. Be before we do, before we bring on our next guest, Mr. Brian Caterino, I um, just want to throw out a shout out to today's sponsors. Season two sponsored by Electronic Merchant Systems, the charge card guys. They'll assist you with your credit card needs. Untamed events, MissRebeccaDodge.com if you need any party planning advice and Jewish senior life. Hello. I hope you guys are enjoying today's show. Uh, Mr. Brian Kitterino, how we doing? Hey, how you doing, Amanda? Excellent. Nice to see you again, unfortunately, Hi. virtually and not in person. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me on today. Oh, it's a pleasure. So tell, tell our audience a little bit about you and the journey that led you to penning your own publications. Right. Well, originally, um, I set out to uh, have an academic career. I got a PhD uh, in political science, and uh, I taught around here for four or five years, but the uh, academic world has changed quite a bit. Um, most of the jobs are part-time and adjunct, and uh, they're very tenuous. You never know whether you're going to get a job another term or not. And it's a really, frankly, unpleasant existence. So after a while, sort of by mutual agreement, um, I didn't teach, I stopped teaching. And uh, my dad was uh, started the uh, public access channel on the west side for the western suburbs of Rochester. So I started uh, volunteering and helping him out. And as he got older and, and not so well and eventually passed away, I, I took it over and I ran it uh, for a number of years. Um, after it ended somewhat uh, 
abruptly, um, I sort of combined two things that I knew, public access and academia, and I decided I wanted to know what was happening with public access because there's a lot of stations shutting down and a lot of conflict. So I've been writing this uh, book on and off for a number of years in between some other projects. And um, it finally just came out about a month, about a month or so ago. So let's um, talk about it. So your your book is titled The Decline of Public Access in Neoliberal Media Regimes. Um, I mean, times certainly have changed quite a bit. I mean, it's, so in your book, you're, you make the argument that there's a decline in interest in public access channels due to the uprising of social media. Uh, so social media is a one-stop platform for people to communicate, to receive knowledge, to be entertained. But what do you think that says about our society and the direction it's lending itself? Well, let me uh, go back one or two steps. I mean, the main uh, theme I'm interested in in the book is uh, the idea that the media should have a public uh, democratic component. So, you know, it shouldn't just be for uh, the rich or the people who run the networks, but there's an element in it um, that everyone should have a, a stake in so that we can all be people and uh, participate in the media and create content and, uh, you know, have a chance to put our say in. I mean, the idea there is that everyone, you know, should be able to put their stories out. Everyone should have a, a voice in the media. Um, and uh, that idea basically uh, founded public access, uh, ideas in the 60s around participatory democracy and participatory media. Now, um, that idea kind of declined in the uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, you know, as our economic and social philosophies changed. And, uh, you know, later on, the internet began to become important. I mean, I won't go through all the, the details in the book. And the internet certainly become uh, an important feature of all our day-to-day -day activities. I mean, we all spend a lot of time on it. I do the shows on, on the internet and uh, does a lot of good things. But there's a, it's kind of a double-edged sword in terms of democracy. And uh, that's one of the ideas I'm concerned with. Um, the issue with uh, the internet is it's become, as you say, you know, ubiquitous in our lives. We look at it for everything. Is whether it's, um, a true public, a true public in the sense that public access was supposed to be a non, non-commercial media in which everyone can participate. Um, because it's privately owned, and because it's commercial, that has many advantages. But the disadvantage is that uh, you know you're not quite as free and open as you might want to be. So that's sort of the dilemma. There's a lot of democratic potential in the internet. There's also a lot of uh, undemocratic elements. I mean, just hypothetically, let's say uh, Mark Zuckerberg decided he wanted to charge you for Facebook. He could, and a lot of people would be priced out or he'd say uh, X person can, uh, for a price can get more access and Y person can't. So. You know, I guess I'm I'm concerned with the the prospects for the internet and the problems. Uh, that's the last part of my book. Well, Brian, um, not to interrupt, but like with with social media, like when you you say that um, there's there's almost like a, a a lack of democracy, but isn't like the free speech part of it, like where you know people are posting anything and everything from when they're literally going to the bathroom to you know like politics and their opinions. I mean, it's, it's contaminated with everything, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, yeah, I mean, you could find anything and everything up there, right? So in a way, like, don't, do you believe that goes against your argument that it's, 
undemocratic in that sense? Um, well, no, I'm not really uh, thinking about the users, but about the people who own it. I mean, in theory, um, and I talk about this some, um, you could be stopped from saying something. People thrown off Facebook for supposedly saying some people maybe deservedly, other people not, or they get their uh, account shut down. Um, so my concern, I mean, it it is a, a vast, uh, if it's a wilderness, sometimes it's, it's good. It's a vast, um, you know, sort of terrain of many different voices, but the it doesn't actually, you don't actually have the legal protections that you had um, in public access. I mean, you can see what's happening with, uh, with Trump and trying to shut down Twitter and all that. So there are some uh, issues. So I guess my question is how do we make it so it's really, uh, really free speech and really democratic? How do you think we could do that, though, by bringing it back to television? But I feel like televised media actually puts more restrictions or um, and and limits the, the demographic a little bit more as opposed to like where social media like you have, you know, grassroots shows like ours right now. You know, like this would never exist if social media wasn't a thing and if we didn't have a few good cameras and. A hot tech guy, right? <laughs> so, so, like, more or less, like, that's what I think. I, I mean, do you disagree with that? Well, um, not exactly. I mean, I think uh, it's really, uh, it's really great. I mean, I think your show is really excellent, and um, there's a lot of uh, good content um, on the. On, um, that's not really. Uh, my objection and you know so the issue is um really like who owns the so uh, who owns the social media platforms say you take something like public access um it's basically like a public forum anyone can stand up and speak so everyone has a chance to speak equally. Now, the, the problems with Facebook is not, and with uh, social media is not that the people aren't creating content. It's that you can get ahead in the queue. Mm -hmm. um, so they use computer-driven uh, decision systems to decide who gets more time than other people. So it's not exactly equal and that's the thing we have to address can we set up an internet that's or at least some space in the internet where everyone's got equal time um do you see where i'm going with that or do i need to explain it a little bit more no i think i understand like i mean oh go ahead you you can buy access on the internet look what happened um in the last election where all these bots, Russian bots were like uh, oh, yeah, infiltrated on the internet. And there's a lot of uh, that and propaganda that's going on. Um, that's the stuff we have to, uh, to look at to create a, a more democratic internet for everybody. Sure, well, I feel like, uh, I mean, there's no question that, you know, we've been infiltrated in multiple ways because of the internet, you know, and that's the downfall of it, you know, like uh, based off of what we like, what we look at, you know, like uh, last show I had um, Chris Sirianni who is uh, in, into tech, you know, and he was talking about password security and like how all these internet like um, surveys that go up, you know, that kind of opens yourself up for hackers. And, you know, there's a world of problems within all the good that the internet, you know, provides. Um, I mean, going back to the public access thing, uh, do you, what about like, do you, I mean, in a, in a way I look at public access kind of as just a part of our, our evolution, right? Like what going through times, you know, things phase in and phase out, other things become popular. And 
you know, for a moment and then they disappear. I mean, what what do you say to somebody who wants to make the argument that public access is just, you know, an old fashioned way of thinking? It's a, a thing of the past. Sure. Well, that's that's a good question. And a lot of people ask that. Um, well, really, there's two uh, issues involved in the preservation of public access. And we don't have to think of it as an either or, either public access or the internet. Um, one thing is that uh, many people still use uh, television as a source of information. I mean, not everyone's on the, the internet as much as maybe you and I. Um, so it's still important uh, for a lot of people. Uh, the second thing that I guess I would emphasize is that uh, the idea of public access, as I sort of stated, was that as a um, democratic public in which everyone can get on. It's first come, first serve. You can't buy your way in or out of it. So I think it still retains um, importance uh, today. But I think what I I'm trying to do here is to say we have to apply that same principle uh, to the internet at it's, it's some place, um, some place where there's a real public space where everyone can get on. Um, again, the the social media, they're great. I, I use the internet all the time, but it isn't quite as, uh, public and open as public access meant to be. Now, of course, it's something where it is open in the sense that, you know, everyone can become a creator. Someone like you can do a show, everyone can create content. But they don't always get that content uh, as visible sure. um, as we think. And that that's really the issue here. But I mean, I don't see why we have to say uh, public access or the internet. We should have a public dimension on TV and cable as well. I mean, uh, broadcasters should have a public obligation to let people have a chance to have their say, to tell their stories. Um, so in terms of what you're saying, uh, your, your theme, I mean, think of it this way, um, that that's a way of getting your self-respect to have your story presented. Um, and not have it crowded out by commercial media, that everyone, you know, has a right and everyone has a, a story um, and something to tell. And lots of groups, you know, don't get on, didn't get on mainstream TV, you know, for a long time it was pretty, pretty uh, white bread TV, you know. But you can apply the same principles to the Internet. You know, it should be a place where everyone has a chance to tell their story equally with other people. And I'm not I'm not convinced that it's as equal and as public as it should be. But well, I'm really not bad. Inter really interesting take on, um, I mean, all of this, I, I believe. I mean, Brian, where could our guests, you know, find out more about you and our and your book. So your book is called Decline of Public Access, Neoliberal Media Regimes. Where could they purchase that? Well, it's uh, available on Amazon and, uh, you know, Barnes and Noble and all the usual uh, kind of booksellers. That's probably the best place to uh, take a look at it. Um, and you can get it through the publisher. Um, so, you know, it's pretty widely available. If you just went on to Amazon and uh, typed my name or the title of the book, um, you know, you'd find it. Sounds great. Well, you guys, make sure you check out Brian's book, Brian Caterino. And uh, he's, as he just mentioned, you could find that on Amazon.com. Let's bring back Miss Hannah PK. Are you ready to rock out one more song before we close out? Certainly, yes. <laughs> Okay. Should I start now? Oh yeah, sure. Go ahead. All right. Well, I, I, earlier I, I sang a song about the rain. So I, I think this song is in a way the response to the song. 
because uh, the song ended, uh, the sun's gonna shine someday or something like that. So here we go. Three, one. So oh, this is uh, this is called I ain't gonna be looking back no more. Dreams really do come true I can tell you my head from my gloves Cause I'm on the moon I ain't gonna be looking back no more It was just yesterday I was sighing in my bed Disappointments from my past Was way over my head But everything had changed And I don't worry since we met Beautiful, talented Ms. Hannah P.K. Thank you so much, Hannah, Thank for performing you. with us this afternoon. My pleasure. Where, oh, where could our audience find your music? Um, no, I, I just started to put more stuff out on my YouTube channel. So it's Hannah P.K. Music. I have a website, hannahpk.com. And I have a whole bunch of new songs that I'm working on. So hopefully uh, I'll, I can start pumping those <laughs> but yes uh, anything in social media you know facebook instagram it's all henna pk music pretty consistently so hope people keep in touch yeah definitely and you keep in touch too i hope i see you again in life uh very soon mm -hmm. so uh, thank you so much again to brian and hannah i'm gonna just leave us out with some closing words so today we touched upon the theme of self-love we also talked a lot about social media so there can be great benefits to social media, such as keeping contact with loved ones, expanding our reach and message personally and professionally, and finding other like-minded people. Those are the benefits. However, we can only benefit from these pros if we remain mindful in the way that we use social media. Simply changing the online environment that you participate and interact with can have a more positive impact on how you perceive yourself and, and your self-esteem. So here are three simple steps that I came up with um, and which I practice personally in order to cultivate a more positive online experience. Number one, stop following people on social media who make you feel bad or that make you experience negative emotions or feelings. Remember the power of choice. You choose what interactions you participate with online. Remove posts from your feed that spark self-comparison. Embrace your authentic self. And also do some research from true sources outside of Facebook, outside of Twitter, Instagram, true sources that you could rely on uh, on those controversial topics. And also continue on your mission to achieve in whichever areas you desire to succeed. Number two, 
Follow people who promote a positive message. The body positivity and the self-care communities are one of the benefits to social media. Replacing self-esteem reducing content with that of an uplifting and supportive online community can be incredibly empowering and inspiring. Number three, remind yourself that social media is the highlight reel of everyone's life. You get the best of the best, right? Don't be blindsided by those perfectly edited and filtered photos with the great lighting and, you know, this, don't be just blindsided by everybody's smiling faces because a lot of the times that's just one picture out of a trillion. Like I think of pictures when I post of my son and I. Bo will take a, a photo of us and that one beautiful photo is probably one out of 20 where I'm getting kicked in the face or <laughs> my hair is being pulled or whatever. You know, for that one beautiful photo, there's, there's a lot of stuff that happens before and after that. So think of all the moments that led up to that. False projections and imagery can greatly distort the reality of the life people truly live. So with that being said, I send you guys off. On a great weekend, remember the more steps we take to create a more positive online social life, the better our real lives can be in terms of self-esteem, mental health, and overall well-being. So go ahead and take back the control of your feeds and of your minds. Big thank you to Boya Productions. Thank you to our sponsors, Electronic Merchant Systems, Untamed Events, and the Jewish Home of Rochester, Jewish Senior Life. Thank you to all that supported our Patreon. If you're a fan of the show, we could always use all the support we could get. It's patreon.com slash afternoon cocktail talk show. And um, we have lots of cool offerings for those who want to support us and for those who are, are in need of some advertising for anything that's up and coming. I wish you all a beautiful weekend. And have a great, great afternoon. <laughs>